Hello and welcome to another edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we will uh, uh, analyze a PET uh, ischemia study and try to correlate that finding of ischemia to some other uh, not very uncommon pathology uh, on ancillary imaging uh, findings. We go back to our uh, traditional checklist that we use every single time we read a perfusion study, whether it's PET or SPECT. In PET, we add, of course, the myocardial blood flow on these things. So if you follow this, you will be able to generate a clinically meaningful report without missing uh, uh, things that you should not miss on these uh, studies. Here's our uh, happy and familiar uh, uh, images for uh, uh, co-registration of the uh, perfusion images and the CT images. On the left-hand side, we have the rest images. On the right-hand side, we have the stress images. And again, with PET, all images are CT attenuation corrected. Therefore, uh, you should look at both and make sure that registration uh, is uh, accurate in both instances so you don't have or generate uh, uh, artifactual defects that can be misconstrued as perfusion defects. The next stop is to do the reconstruction images. And immediately here on the left-hand side, you can see in the stress images on top, uh, you have issues with the reconstruction here where the axis of the heart is uh, tilted. Uh, with a very simple uh, rotation here, you can end up with the images on the right. You click the processing button and then you will get these images. So these are the traditional uh, rest and stress images, rest on the bottom, stress on top. Uh, we go uh, immediately to analyze the short axis of the rest images. We can see here a complete uh, donut. However, this donut uh, cavity appears to be very small and, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, obliteration of that cavity, at least from the mid ventricle up, as you can see here in the vertical long axis. We don't have any perfusion defect per se, but what we have is this uh, uh, very small LV cavity and bright uptake everywhere else, except at the base of the heart, which can be probably uh, signal averaging uh, in these kind of uh, semi-quantitative images. When you go to the stress images, you can see a similar uh, pattern, except now we have a new nice uh, perfusion defect uh, in the apex with focal dilatation of the left ventricular uh, apex right here. So we have a, a LAD uh, a perfusion defect involving the apex of the left ventricle, indicating what we traditionally call ischemia in the uh, left ventricle. Again, this is just to show you that defect again and uh, bring your attention the change of the left ventricular size, uh, at least uh, end systolic and end diastolic uh, uh, sizes from the uh, rest images to the stress uh, images with LP dilatation. We go to score these uh, segments uh, because of the improvement in the basal segments here from rest to stress, we end up uh, zeroing all these uh, rest images and calling them normal. However, you can see here on the reversibility map, nicely generated here, uh, nice uh, uh, significant perfusion defect in the apex and periapical segments, uh, resulting in a sum difference score of 11 uh, that's the some different different score meaning ischemia uh, or the extent of ischemia in the left ventricle. We go next to the histograms. Uh, looking at, uh, at this here, you can see the rest histograms and the uh, post uh, stress histograms. Again, these are uh, QA uh, importance, important uh, images to make sure that we have a stability of the heart rate from rest to stress so we can trust the ejection fraction generated uh, from these uh, images. Uh, then we go to the uh, gated images. Again, uh, stress images, you have nice contour, nice tracking of the left ventricle. Uh, but on the rest images, you can see this poor tracking of the left ventricle uh, here. The system could not, or the software could not identify left ventricular cavity to track. Therefore, you're going to end up with images like that. Whenever you end up with a situation, you try as much as you can to correct it. But even with our best efforts here in this image here, we try to correct it. And you can see actually we made it worse, where now the tracking is even worse and the ejection fraction is now 17. Of course, we're not gonna report this, so we ignore the rest images because of the, our inability to track the uh, walls, and we're gonna only report the stress images. And again, you can see on the stress images, this is the left ventricular apical uh, hypokinesia or dyskinesia. We go to the dyskinesia analysis on the right-hand side. Again, in the traditional fashion, we show you uh, Dyssynchronous analysis in a normal patient, rest and stress, all the segments contracting almost uh, in unison, uh, arriving at peak contractility at the same time, rest and stress. Whereas in our patient, you can see this, this, this scattering of the contractility and no segment achieves this nice 
uh, summation of contractility uh, resulting in, uh, in significant uh, dyssynchrony. Despite our best efforts, we could not generate uh, activity curves that are reasonable for these patients. Therefore, we did not report the myocardial blood flow or the flow reserves. So this is something that happens every now and then. You should not report it if the activity curves are uh, not reasonable and are not tracking the activity in the left ventricle properly. You should not report it just because you have it. Uh, it can confuse you. Uh, next, we go to generate a meaningful report. This patient came to the ED with chest pain. Uh, she had an uninterpretable EKG uh, and she was unable to exercise. She was 82 years old. Uh, we uh, record the dose we gave and what time we gave the dose and what uh, stress agent we used. Uh, in this instance, it's tracodenosin. Uh, you can see here that this person had uh, uh, is, her BMI is uh, 34 or almost 35. Uh, uh, she has history of hypertension, uh, she's on beta blockers, and she has history of atrial fibrillation too uh, on ticosin. Uh, again, we can look at this uh, for quality assurance. This is a heart rate at rest and, and immediately post stress uh, going up to 69 uh, with a slight drop in ejection fraction. This is with regadenosin. So this is again, because we're doing PET here, we're imaging at peak stress under the camera. So all the images of stress are immediately peak stress. This is the patient's uh, EKG here. And you can see this person has significant left ventricular hypertrophy uh, with the T uh, wave changes and almost U waves all the way here at the end, uh, uh, reflecting what probably we're gonna see uh, uh, next. So uh, we go to fill the left ventricle. Left ventricular function was normal and uh, we will score the, uh, the wall motion abnormality in the apex uh, uh, right here that we can see uh, on the right hand side here. Uh, we uh, remind ourselves that this person had ischemia and left anterior, anterior descending artery territory, so we scored that, uh, as you can see here. And then uh, this patient had no uh, uh, coronary classification, so we will uh, not uh, uh, look at, uh, we will score that as no coronary uh, classifications. Uh, and we scored this uh, stress test as intermediate risk uh, because of the presence of uh, a moderate amount of ischemia uh, and that uh, LV, uh, focal LV cavity dilatation. Uh, this is not one of the highest risk tests that I've shown you in prior uh, presentations. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the findings on the test. Again, they generated as a, a consistent conclusion. So all our readers in our lab would have exactly the same template to work with and almost the same uh, kind of conclusion. So we don't have a lot of uh, uh, poetry in reporting, but we'd rather have uh, consistent reporting that everybody is, uh, is uh, happy with. Uh, so we report here uh, a finding that the probably uh, we should focus on in the next few slides, which is we report this pattern consistent with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy after we reviewed the echo. So here's uh, first what happened to the patient. This patient went on to have a cardiac cath based on the findings uh, of this, uh, of this uh, stress test. And you can see here, there is no there are no perfusion defects in the left system, uh, uh, sorry, no uh, uh, blockages in the left system or the right system uh, here on the coronary angiogram. However, when you go to the echocardiogram that this patient had, we start on the right hand side with some uh, contrast echo. You can see obliteration of left ventricular uh, uh, cavity from the mid uh, part uh, on with this residual uh, a contrast in the apex of the left ventricle indicating a small apical aneurysm. And when you look here, this is a very distinct and uh, pathognomonic pattern we see on the echocardiography, uh, where you can have, uh, instead of the flow going from the cavity, from the apex to the uh, base of the heart exiting into the aorta, you can see some reversal of flow uh, of, uh, of blood into the apex of the left ventricle. And that is uh, something we, we are familiar with, and I will show you some uh, images later. Uh, you can see again this uh, uh, obliteration of the LV cavity, very thick heart, spade-shaped appearance of the of the left ventricle. Uh, this is a, a very well-described pattern, spade-shaped appearance of the left ventricle, commonly seen in patients with apical hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. Now, uh, how do we justify the, uh, the apical defect we saw? Uh, these patients, as well uh, described by this paper from uh, my colleague, Milan Desai, and uh, Jack Imaging, you can see these patients with, because of this reversal of flow, constant reversal of flow, uh, the hypothesis is they form these apical aneurysms 
that can sometimes actually even have uh, clots in them and result in strokes. So the first presentation for a patient like this can be sometimes stroke uh, because of these uh, uh, apical aneurysms that can form from this uh, reversal of flow uh, from the uh, mid cavity into the apex. So probably that's what we uh, saw in this patient. And this is the reference uh, uh, to this uh, paper. So this is a very, uh, we encountered this at least half a dozen times to probably uh, a dozen times a year in our lab with patients for, who present for uh, chest pain, uh, abnormal EKG, uh, shortness of breath, can end up uh, having a nuclear stress test as their first test uh, uh, into the system. And with that, uh, we, we should be aware and uh, acutely aware of uh, this abnormality uh, in order not to be uh, uh, fooled and misconstrued this as a, uh, only as a perfusion defect, but probably identify uh, the uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this instance or other anomalies that we will discuss in future uh, videos uh, that go beyond actually what we look at usually in nuclear stress testing, which we look at perfusion defects, ischemia, scar, uh, even uh, metabolic imaging, we look at uh, uh, hibernation or increased uh, inflammation. But in this instance, we're looking at morphology. And if you see an LV morphology that reminds you of a pattern that you're familiar with, in this instance, a spade-shaped apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy pattern, you should be reporting this and integrate it in your clinical impression. And you should not be shy uh, and uh, just look at the nuclear images. If you have access to other imaging modality, other clinical data, look at it and uh, integrate it in your, uh, in your uh, report. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for this uh, next for this uh, session, uh, for listening to uh, for this presentation, and I uh, hope you're enjoying it. And we'll continue uh, with uh, other sessions uh, in the near future.